Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the All Saints podcast. I want to introduce today's topic by telling you a story about a friend of mine. This is going back 20 years or so when he related this story to me. And as I remembered, remember it, he describes a very disturbing experience that he had at work one day. He was sitting at his desk. He had quite a lot to do. And as he was thinking about what to do, this growing sense of anxiety bordering on panic began to seize him. He felt increasingly overwhelmed by the multitude of different tasks that he had to do. And this sense of feeling overwhelmed got so intense that he had to physically drag himself away from his desk, so to speak, drag himself home and recover physically from the experience. He got to a point where he'd just frozen, unable to do anything. He felt completely overwhelmed by the tasks before him. He was, as it happens, a professional theologian, a writer, a teacher, academic administrator. He was also doing some continuing professional development and various other responsibilities bearing down on him. He had lots of things to do. And the way he describes it, I, I would liken it to what happens if you have your uh, laptop open and you've got you know, an internet browser and it's got sort of 35 tabs all lined up across the top of the screen and none of them will work because anytime you try and focus on one there are 34 others chewing up the cpu time and so you just can't get anything to happen because there are too many things going on in the background all at once maybe modern operating systems can handle that but you get the image there are there are ways of overloading the capacity that we have which make us feel unable even to begin with the smallest of the tasks that are set before us. Now, I gather this uh, experience is becoming sufficiently common uh, in the business world and perhaps elsewhere that it has acquired the name overwhelm. That might be new to you. It was sort of new to me in the last year or two. Uh, but even if the term is new to you, I'm sure you can empathize with perhaps firsthand or certainly imagine the idea or the sensation of feeling overwhelmed by the multitude of things you've got to do. I'm sure perhaps you felt it yourself. It may be that you felt it at work. It may be that you felt it uh, in other contexts. And what I want to do today is to try and talk to you about that, just to share some thoughts about it. I have no illusions about solving the problem in its entirety, but I do think that trying to think about it from a Christian perspective and try and think through it theologically, so to speak, may be helpful even just in describing what's going on and the reasons for it in biblical and Christian theological terms. Sometimes it's helpful to, to try and get a handle uh, on the problem. Uh, one, uh, what would I say, one uh, stimulus to consider this question at this point actually came in last night's Bible study. I'm recording this on Thursday afternoon, 16th of February, last night, 15th, I actually read during Bible study an extract from this commentary on uh, Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs, a challenge to church leaders to help people in their congregations in relation to the practicalities of their working lives. I'll read you uh, the short extract that I read yesterday. Will the local church take responsibility for addressing in all specificity the issues that most of its members struggle with during the work week. And I'm struck by that in all specificity with the details in mind, not just the bland, broad, big picture. Christians have a wonderful opportunity to transform their culture and society through the daily routine activities of the marketplace. Agree with that totally. Um, but uh, the writer continues, it's a frontier of sanctification that ought to be explored and developed by churches. After a short break, he writes, what a wonderful impact would be made for the kingdom if our spiritual leaders, ouch, there he is talking about people like me, were intensely attuned to the marketplace and took the marketplace and took God's interest and instructions about it into the Sunday morning pulpit and midweek prayer meeting. Well, there you are. Um, this is a Christian commentator challenging pastors and others with responsibility for leading and teaching churches to help their congregations with the really nitty-gritty practical matters of work and what it's like to be a Christian at work. And so I think this might be helpful. I've been encouraged also in this by um, the recognition that a number of people have uh, come to me over the last few months with questions about what, what am I supposed to do with these uh, feelings of feeling a bit overwhelmed or anxiety or whatever it is when they encounter them. And so again, I want to try to help by not 
solving the problem in a podcast. That's not a realistic aim. But I think simply by trying to lay out in biblical terms what's going on and why it's going on might start to pave the way for something like moving towards a solution. So let me try and begin first just by setting this issue in the broadest possible context. The best framework for thinking about this sense that sometimes you may have at work or as you contemplate work or as you're around the house or as you're there on a Saturday morning trying to figure out which DIY job to start with or if you're trying to handle household admin or if you're trying to deal with the daily practicalities of raising or schooling children or whatever it is the best overall biblical framework to understand this within is the creation mandate in Genesis 1. You recall what that says, I'm just going to flick back to it in my Bible right here. I had it open somewhere else which I also want to share with you but uh, Genesis 1, you all know this very well. When God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over all the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Notice both male and female have this dominion role, though in different domains at various points. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, etc. Now, this uh, experience of feeling overwhelmed by the tasks that you have to do ought best to be understood in theological terms as a sense of feeling overloaded by the number of different things that there are around us that we could do. There are many, many calls on your time and your life and your family, certainly professionally if you have a job uh, of any kind, and certainly a job that involves managing other people or responding to other people or any kind of proactivity, there are always going to be an increasing number of different things that you could do. And all of that falls under the heading of uh, the creation mandate. And so that helps us to understand a couple of things uh, at the beginning. The first is this. The reason you're feeling overwhelmed is not because you're weak. It would be a mistake to say that. The reason you're feeling overwhelmed is because there is a mismatch between our capacity to take on these challenging tasks of organising our lives or of making progress in the workplace or of, uh, running a home or of raising children. There's a mismatch between our capacity and the demands that those task, tasks place on us. And though it's possible, OK, it's theoretically possible that you're overwhelmed because you're weak, it's not necessarily the case. It could simply be that you're taking on a lot. You're taking on a huge amount and you could be a person of high capacity and a high level of competence and it's just you've taken on something that's even bigger. And I want to commend you for that. That's certainly the case with my friend who I, uh, whose story I recounted uh, at the start of this episode. He is very far from being incompetent. In fact, he's one of the brightest people I've ever met. Uh, extremely hardworking, diligent, competent, fine teacher and lecturer, great theological mind, and actually highly organised. He's not your stereotypical college professor with post-it notes stuck to his front and just junk and paper everywhere. He's a very organised thinker and an organised worker. But even he felt overwhelmed, and he felt overwhelmed because he'd got to a point where he'd just taken on more than he, even at his high level of competence, could handle at that time. Now, it's important to realise that because what this means is this is not a sign that something's gone wrong. If you feel overwhelmed, it could simply be, you know, this is a temporary blip. You're op operating, let's say, at um, 85 or 86 on a scale of uh, how much you're able to take on and your workload has been going, climbing 60, 70, up and down, 60, 75, 85, and then suddenly it spikes and hits 90 and then drops down to 80, and then it spikes and hits 110 and then drops down again. And when it spikes, it goes through the ceiling that you have personally, your personal capacity to cope with the kind of strain that you're under. Now, 
What's going to happen as a consequence of that? Well, if you handle it well, your capacity for work, your capacity to fulfill the dominion mandate will actually increase with time as you grow and are strengthened in and through these experiences. Now, it's possible to, so to speak, break yourself. If you have a capacity here, 85 on whatever arbitrary scale we're talking about, and you put yourself under a load that's 700, it's probably going to crush you. There is a certain point at which you say, no, no, this is too much. But all of us know, don't we, the experience of being stretched and growing through the experience. We certainly know that in our lives, beginning from when we were younger children, through being young adults and then growing towards maturity and then whatever age uh, you might think I am uh, and beyond, uh, your capacity varies during your life. And in general, certainly in the early years of adulthood and then moving towards the middle of life, it increases. And we should anticipate that. And I want to encourage you. The first thing I want to say to somebody who is feeling uh, a bit overwhelmed by all the things that they've got to do is praise God for all those things you've got to do, that you've had the courage and conviction and opportunity to take on. Now, it's not to say you might not want to reorganize them or even press pause on some of them for a while. I'll come to that in a, in a few minutes. But just the mere fact that you're feeling a bit overwhelmed could just be the normal experience of growing and taking on new challenges. So look at yourself for a second. If you're feeling a bit overwhelmed, is it because you've just started a new business or started a new job or had your second child or just got married or just started at college or uh, just begun a new year at school or something? And you look around, take some time. Could you actually identify some specific things which are just a bit much? Fine, great, well done. And it's not necessarily the case that you want to stop doing them, but you want to be aware that, okay, perhaps this is what's causing the sense of being overwhelmed. And then we'll come a few minutes perhaps to think about uh, how we might um, handle that. So that's the first underlying theological point, that this sense of feeling overwhelmed comes from some kind of mismatch between our capacity and the responsibilities and opportunities that we're taking on in relation to this central text at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, to subdue the world, the, the dominion mandate or creation mandate or cultural mandate. And so well done for taking it on. The next thing to point out, and this is probably obvious if you've uh, been feeling this before or for any length of time, is that there are any number of secular remedies for these uh, experiences. You can find life coaches and websites and YouTube videos full of hacks and tips and hints about how to handle that feeling of being overwhelmed. And I, I don't know whether this will surprise any of you if I say this, but I want to say that some of those are probably not bad and you might want to have a think about them. Uh, theologically, the reason is in part that uh, these features of our lives and of the world around us are hardwired into creation in such a way that even people who aren't looking in scripture for answers about how the world works will, over time, gradually, through trial and error, eventually, in some cases, bump into workable solutions to these kinds of problems. So I'm very far from uh, despising some of these, uh, some of the tackier life hack websites I don't have a huge amount of time for, but I've found one or two books uh, on the subject, or maybe three or four books on these kinds of subjects, quite helpful in so far as they're coming from people who have some technical experience in business or in medicine, and really what they're doing is they're uncovering the mechanisms behind things which are, in one way or another, written in or written behind the scenes of the scriptures. But they're articulating them in other ways. And so I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Um, it, it won't come as any surprise, uh, those of you who I've talked to about this. Uh, I read a book about sleep a number of years ago, which I found really, really helpful. And it just put... Um, fresh flesh on the bones of what the psalmist uh, Solomon in Psalm 127 says, 
It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. We all know, actually, and many of us from personal experience, that there comes a point during the day when if you're just working, working, working long into the night, your productivity starts to drop. And if you don't suffer on that evening when you're writing an essay fueled by caffeine and um, Red Bull and whatever else it is you're drinking, you'll certainly suffer for it the next day or the day after. You can't sustainably work like that. And the reason is, in biblical terms, that it's vain to keep trying to work as though you have an infinite capacity for work. You have a finite capacity for work. And God gives to his beloved sleep. Perhaps, in fact, we should understand this as a a way of enforcing humility upon us. It's a way of imposing the requirement for us to realize that we're finite. After eight or 10 or 12 hours of really draining work in a day, you just run out of gas and you need to recognize that you've hit the ceiling and you need to have a break. Now, this is the point where if you're thinking about the sense of being overwhelmed and here's your capacity and here are the demands placed upon you, there may come a point at which you just have to say, you know what, I have to press pause on something. There's a project I'd like to get done, but it's just going to be too much if I try and do it now. There are just too many things to do and not enough hours in the day. So that's one of the kind of hard limits you might run into in uh, thinking about how to bring back into alignment the demands that you've taken on and placed upon yourself with your capacities to undertake them. Um, the sleep book it makes a number of interesting points. The, uh, sometimes one of the things that happens in us is that our emotions become somewhat difficult to handle in situations where we feel overwhelmed we might get frustrated uh, we might just become anxious it actually turns out and solomon didn't know this but you know he speaks about sleep better than he knows it, it turns out that sleep among gazillion other things that it does uh, helps us to regulate our emotions and we actually all know this firsthand if we've had children you get to a certain point in the evening if you've got a young child and it's 10 30 or 11 at night or something and for some reason you've kept your toddler up until then and you discover that he or she is now somewhat tearful and trying to discipline a child trying to stop them crying at half past 11 at night when they're tearful and they just need to go to sleep what are you going to say no they're just tired they need to rest they'll be much better in the morning well of course they are because all of us have a finite capacity to regulate our emotions and sometimes it becomes very obvious with children they just run out of capacity to not be crying when they get exhausted but something similar happens to us but often it can happen to us in a kind of uh, chronic, ongoing way. If you're sleeping five or six hours a night instead of seven or eight, and you do that for two, three, four, five months, well, just expect to run out of gas. Expect to find it difficult to regulate your emotions. Expect to find it hard to handle complex tasks, because it turns out we now know the biology and neuroscience that lies behind Solomon's conviction here in Psalm 127 which accounts for why you just can't regulate your emotions and your hormone levels and everything else if you're not well rested, and not well slept. Same thing goes for food. Um, I tried this myself accidentally on numerous occasions. You know, you get up on a Saturday morning and the house is quiet and you think, right, I can get on with some uh, work that he's doing outside before it gets too hot and in the summer. And so you go outside, oh, I'll just skip breakfast or just have a cup of tea and you work sort of 7.30, 8.30, 9.30, 10.30, you get to 11 or 11.30. And I remember on one or two occasions starting to find myself getting really frustrated and uh, not thinking clearly, making silly mistakes, um, going from outside into the garage to find something and then forgetting what it was I'd gone in there to find. Ever had that experience? Well, I hadn't eaten anything. You can't survive working hard mentally or working hard physically without proper fuel. I mean, if that isn't obvious to us, I don't know what is. A man shall not live by bread alone, but neither shall man live without any kind of bread at all. And so just those basic things, uh, you find throughout the scriptures, they're assumed in many places. If you're not eating and you're not sleeping well, then don't expect to find yourself able to handle complex cognitive or physical tasks at any point in the day. Uh, Theologically, what's probably behind this is a proper theology of the body. And this warrants further uh, consideration, I think, um, more than we've got time for now. But there is a tendency in, especially 
uh, evangelical, but also in Reformed Christian teaching, to focus when it comes to lifestyle issues on the mind for Reformed people and the mind and the heart for uh, evangelical people. And that's an oversimplification. I mean, there, there are Reformed folks who, who will focus heavily on the heart. Perhaps it's better just to say mind and the heart. In other words, the internal aspects of our character. So you'll be familiar with this if, if you're trying to uh, raise a child and encourage a, a teenager, say, to, to work hard, you'll find yourself thinking, oh, th it's a heart issue. And of course, it is a heart issue. There are internal aspects of our disposition, our desires, and our character which shape our lives. And so we've got a tradition of reflecting on the relationship between how we feel and think, mind and heart, and what we do. But what we haven't given such a lot of thought to historically as reformed and evangelical Christians, is the importance of the body. It turns out the body really matters. Now, we're recovering some of this in our reformed tradition. And you see it, for example, in our liturgy, where we stand and sit and kneel and raise our hands. Right? Those are bodily actions. And what we realize is those bodily actions start to shape us. But you notice in our services, we also eat. We don't just have a sermon about eating or think about eating bread and drinking wine we actually eat because we're embodied creatures and there is a mysterious sense to, to a certain extent in which our bodily appetites and our bodily needs are somehow coordinated with our spiritual lives and our relationship with the lord and what we do in the world and the most obvious way to see that is our bodies actually have needs in fact another way to put it is that our bodies impose a kind of restriction upon us. They keep us in one place. They impose upon us needs for rest and needs for food. And those needs have to be met if we're to function well in the world, serving Christ or serving our families or serving our, uh, the companies we work for or working in whatever it is that we're doing. So, in other words, behind all that that I'm talking, saying, talking about uh, food and Eat, uh, sleeping and so on is a very very deep and complex theology of the body which i think is under explored so if it doesn't seem intuitive to you that might be why it might be that we've just not got the theological instincts in place to realize how important our bodily functions eating sleeping and so on are in relation to things like fulfilling the creation mandate not getting overwhelmed at work anyway so that's some things in the background now uh, what could we do if we're turning from these background considerations where really uh, what we're trying to do at the moment is to identify and describe a theologically informed and biblically informed framework for understanding the problem. How can we transition from there to something which looks more like a solution? Well, I don't want to oversimplify, and I certainly don't want to give you the impression that this is going to be a panacea to cure all our ills, but I do want to make a couple of suggestions. Now, one of them uh, arose yesterday again in Bible study, and this took us to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. I want to just take us back there, and um, if I might just share it with you again. Ecclesiastes 10 from verse 2 all the way to the end uh, talks in various ways about the challenges of work, and particularly, and you're thinking uh, of the ancient Near Eastern context, late Bronze Age Israel, where there were more uh, carpenters and stonemasons than there were accountants and computer software engineers. Verses 8 to 11 speak about this. Let me read verses um, 9 and 10 particularly, and I'll, I'll then explain why I'm reading these and why I think it's so important. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. Now, what's going on here? Well, it's like the whole of the book of Ecclesiastes. It's reflecting on the frustration of life. Uh, life is like mist, hevel, sometimes translated uh, vanity or meaningless. Uh, 
those vanity and meaninglessness are, are not great translations for the term, actually. It means more like life is hard to grasp, hard to understand, ephemeral, beautiful, but transient, like mist or fog are. Uh, that's what the word hevel means, which is translated uh, vanity of in your Bibles in Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2. The book as a whole is talking about the character of life in the world being characterized in that way as a consequence of sin and the fall, as well as God's creative goodness. And here, uh, it's just reflecting on, or the author is reflecting on what he's seen. He's, King Solomon, he's seen people working hard, quarrying stone, and suddenly a piece of the stone they're quarrying lands on them. Or he's seen somebody splitting wood with an axe. And as he splits the, the chunks of wood, one of them flies off and hits him or injures somebody else. What's he seeing? He's seeing that the world that we have to work in is unpredictable. To a certain extent, it's dangerous. It's difficult to work in. It's wild. And so verse 9, just by itself, I think is probably designed to engender a sense of respect for the challenges of working in the world. And again, if we go back to where we, where we began, if you're taking on the challenge of a new job or faced with the challenge of a couple of growing children or managing a growing household or whatever it is that you feel sometimes overwhelmed by, realize that the reason for this is because the world is somewhat overwhelming. And one of the things it would be wise for us to do is to have a proper sense of respect for our incapacity. We are really very small. We've been given dominion over the works of God's hands, Genesis 1. But just look around you for a second at the magnitude of the tasks that are set before us. But for the grace of God, they'd be completely impossible. And even by God's grace, sometimes they feel, like we've said, a little bit overwhelming. And so just to realize at the outset, actually, this is going to be difficult. And that then leads us into verse 10. Because in verse 10, you get not a solution, that's too trite, but you do get a glimpse of a solution. And it's, it's put in almost a slightly tongue-in-cheek or amusing sort of way. We're still with somebody quarrying stone or more likely splitting logs. And Solomon remarks, if the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. Right, so you see the image, right? Somebody has got this axe made of iron, but it's blunt. He hasn't bothered to sharpen the edge. And so he's having to wield it with ever greater strength just to split the logs. And if you've ever tried to do this, I actually asked one all, all the people at Bible study on Wednesday night, I asked this, and, and one young man said, yeah, I've tried to do that, I tried to split logs with a blunt axe. And uh, you have to wield it much more fiercely in order to split logs if it's blunt. And of course, if you're doing that, then you're much more likely to injure yourself or somebody else or the axe head will come flying off or it'll just take longer to do the job properly. What would be the smart thing to do? Oh, yeah, what does it say? Uh, sharpen the edge. And then you notice again the last little line in that uh, triplet in verse 10. Wisdom helps one to succeed. And I wonder if what Solomon is doing is just trying to tap the brakes on our enthusiastic zeal. Just think about it for a second. Think about the real practical nitty-gritty aspects of your working life. When you find yourself, you've jumped into whatever tasks you have, and after half an hour, you're feeling like you're getting nowhere, and the number of new things that are occurring to you that you've got to do, it's just growing and growing and growing. It's feeling slightly overwhelming. Did you pause beforehand? Did you just stop and think, hold on a second, how would I best go about this? Or did you do the equivalent of what Solomon has clearly seen somebody do? Just grab the first tool to hand, a blunt axe with a loose head, and just start swinging it around wildly trying to split logs. I actually experienced something like this myself. It wasn't a blunt axe problem. I actually sharpened the axe beforehand, but I was trying to split logs. I'll tell you what happened. I started with these logs that were about 14 inches long and 6 inches diameter, and I put them on the uh, chopping block that I got from another much bigger log. And I was trying to split them. And of course, because they're 14 inches long, 
there's nothing I could do to get the axe to go all the way through. It's quite tough wood. I think it's like oak or something. So I'm trying to split these logs during the, the cold snap that we just had a few weeks ago. Couldn't do it. Probably spent best part of 10 minutes trying to split these logs and getting nowhere. And then in the end, I just thought for about 30 seconds, took one of the logs to the garage, took the chainsaw out, cut it in half. So now I've got two logs that are seven inches long, brought it back, put it on the chopping, put it on the chopping block. First time I got the axe, went straight through it. Split it with no problem at all. Now, there are two ways to do that job, aren't there? You can get nowhere in 10 minutes wildly flailing around with your axe, or you can just think and stop and pause. Wisdom helps one to succeed. The wisdom to step back from the task to actually honour the creation that God has placed us in. By recognising that this is bigger than us, it's tougher than us, it's stronger than us, it's more demanding than we can just intuitively cope with. And if I am to succeed, if I am to rule this part of the world and take dominion over those logs that I'm trying to split, I'm going to need to think about it. Now, can you transfer that lesson into any other domains? I was talking to my wife, Nicole, about this last night and she remarked about um, painting, uh, painting a wall or painting a door or something. The actual painting bit of painting often doesn't take very long at all, especially all the bits in the middle where you've got a big thick roller and you're going over a wall. But it's all the preparation beforehand, isn't it? And it's all the cutting in at the edges and it's all the clearing up afterwards. It's the little things. It's making sure you do all the preparation right and everything else right. And then the actual task of painting is much easier. But trying to fix a wall that you've painted badly and all the paint is peeling because the surface wasn't prepared properly well good luck with that much better wisdom helps one succeed get it right first time step back from the work and see if there's a wise way to approach it i think that's the first practical thought that occurs at least to me as i reflect on this the second has to do with words i want to just reflect on this for a, a moment or two you notice in scripture that it is by words that all things are created. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and so on. And, the, and God said is repeated, not all the time, but many of the uh, times in Genesis 1, on many of the occasions on which God makes things. It's by the word of his power that the creation is upheld, we're told in the New Testament, the word of Christ's power. Words are how creation and providence are mediated so to speak god speaks the world into existence and god rather god spoke the world into existence and god still speaks to uphold it in being words hold things together and bring order genesis 1 where previously there was darkness and chaos and how do they do that well it's interesting i was talking to somebody about this and and the thought occurred to me that i wonder if they work something like this if you're looking at a large pile of things you've got to do lots of tasks maybe you've got your desk and it's like i've told i've got my desk those books there a pile of stuff over there i've got papers over there that you can't see i've got things on my to-do list on the computer and all these kinds of things if i'm looking at all those things i see them all at once and they can feel overwhelming precisely because i see them all at once but if you speak about them, or actually write about them, if you use words, you have to speak about them one at a time. Have you noticed that? It's the difference between seeing and hearing. If you're looking at me on video now, and I hold my hand up like this, you can look at my face and my hand at the same time, two things at once. I mean, you can't focus in on any one of them, but you can take them both in all at once and actually you're also noticing the color of the wall behind me and the other things on the screen that you're looking at looking doesn't help us really to sort out things into individual boxes but speaking does speaking is not a parallel process speaking is a serial process it's one after the other process so if you were to let's say write down the things you've got to do you notice you write them down one at a time and you're then forming a framework by which you're able to take control of them. You notice something similar on those occasions where you've had a problem 
and you talk it through with somebody. Have you ever noticed this? That the process of talking it through with somebody either highlights points where you're not sure what you're going to do, or wonderfully, it can bring a sense of clarity to what you have to do because you're thinking in a way which corresponds to how you're actually going to work if you're going to work fruitfully, which is you're going to work on these tasks one at a time. So I wonder if those two themes, respecting creation enough to take it seriously and take a step back, you know, prepare the wall before you paint it, chop the wood into manageable chunks before you try and split it, assess the task before you try and take it on, Ecclesiastes 10. And then secondly, try to put into words what it is that you need to do. Because in doing that, you will necessarily be breaking up it up into chunks that you can take on one at a time, one after the other. I wonder if those two things may be helpful. I have no illusions, like I said, that they will solve all of your problems. But I wonder if they might help to make a start. And I hope that's helpful. Um, I'm conscious that to a certain extent, I'm in talking about things of this kind, I feel like I'm stepping outside the, the field of expertise of a pastor, outside of scriptural teaching and outside of uh, theological reflection and pastoral counselling. But on the other hand, part of me wants to resist that feeling and keep trying to talk with you practically about things like this, because I'm prompted by what uh, Dr. Frederick says in that commentary. I, I feel an obligation to try and really get as practical as I possibly can with the implications of biblical principles. I don't want to leave things at the level of principles and then leave you all to try and sort out how they work out in practice, because I'm convinced that actually scripture speaks to these very nitty gritty areas of our lives. And perhaps in some of these ways, uh, what I've said today might be helpful. If it has been, uh, then please do give me a shout. If it hasn't been, or if there are other questions that arise because of this, then please, please definitely uh, get in touch, especially those of you who are at All Saints. Uh, as you know, this podcast really is for you. Uh, I'm conscious that we have listeners elsewhere, and of course, you are more than welcome to tune in. It's great to have you with us. Uh, but for those of you who are here at All Saints, in particular, and for anybody else watching, I hope that's been helpful. The Lord bless you, and those of you who are at All Saints here with us, God bless. Bye for now, and see you soon. Thank you.